All right. Now, before we begin, and particularly for our international participants, um, in, in Australia, we traditionally do an acknowledgement of country, which recognizes the traditional owners of the lands on which an event is held. So as we gather for this meeting, physically dispersed and virtually constructed, let us take a moment to reflect the meaning of place. And doing so, recognize the various traditional lands on which we do our business today. We acknowledge the elders, past, present, and emerging of all the land we work and live on and their ancestral spirits with gratitude and respect. So welcome all to the Conspirituality Colloquium and this panel on conspirituality.net. Now, um, just a word to all participants. Uh, we welcome your questions at any time throughout the session. Please type and enter your questions into the Q&A box uh, and our presenters will answer questions at the end of the session, so a combined Q&A. Now, because of the nature of this topic, um, we ask all participants to engage civilly, so any abusive or disruptive behaviour will not be tolerated and anyone who engages in it will be removed from um, this space. So we have three speakers here today with us from the Conspirituality podcast. Uh, I will do an introduction of each of them before the start of their presentation. So first up, we have Derek Beres, uh, who is a multifaceted author and media expert who is based in Los Angeles. He's currently the head of content marketing and community at Center. Uh, he's also a columnist for Big Think and co-host of the Conspirituality podcast. His latest book is Heroes Dose, The Case for Psychedelics in Ritual and Therapy. And then after that, after he speaks, we will have Matt, uh, Julian, then followed by Matthew. Now over to you, Derek. Thank you, Anchi, and thank you everyone for having us today. Uh, I'm going to start by looking a little bit of at the science, or rather what is often the pseudoscience of conspiritualists. So while when America went into lockdown a year ago, many influential figures in the yoga and wellness community immediately mobilized and conspiracy theories quickly began circulating digitally. And usually they were attached to supplements or services that aligned with their anti-vaccination, and then what emerged as the anti-masking rhetoric. So I want to begin by going over a few examples here. There was popular raw foodist and superfood salesman David Wolf, who began promoting colloidal silver as his, quote, number one recommendation under the current crisis, end quote, which is his way of saying that it cures COVID without declaring it outright. And then you had Green Med Info founder Sayer G, who immediately turned his popular website, greenmedinfo.com, which has over a million visitors per month, into an anti COVID propaganda machine. And he also offered a range of curated research to push that narrative. Now, his website sells a variety of membership levels for access, the highest coming in at $849 per year. And he also includes a special section in that website for paying members that links vaccines with autism, obviously a long disproven claim, but that still gets circulated often. Now, former psychiatrist Kelly Brogan, who is the wife of Sayer G, has used her very large social media following to promote anti-vax and COVID is a hoax propaganda. And she also sells memberships to her website and regularly offer, offers expensive coaching sessions. For example, her 44-day Vital Mind Reset program boasts over 2,300 members, each of which who pay up to $1,000 for access. You have physician Zach Bush, who claims that germs don't cause disease, and he promotes a 19th century theory called terrain theory as the origins of all viruses and disease. Now, besides selling a range of supplements on his site, his Virginia-based M Clinic sells a number of services that fit his disease narrative, including solid state technology, which are wave patterns that are purported to, quote, harmonize disrupted patterns of energy within the body, end quote, and 
phase angle measurement, which is popular on our podcast. He's supposed to examine cell integrity health and hydration respiration, a 40-minute session that delivers pure molecular water in a true gaseous state in order to boost immune systems. And immune system boosting is a main message of conspiritualists as a way of circumventing and um, decrying vaccines while selling their services and supplements. So you'll see that often in, in this world. You have San Francisco Dr. Thomas Cowan, who recently surrendered his medical license due to his fringe beliefs. And he, last March, he released a popular YouTube video using the outdated pseudosciences of Rudolf, pseudoscience of Rudolf Steiner. And he claimed that 5G causes COVID-19. Now he plans on returning to medicine as an unlicensed health coach and will sell a line of supplements, of course. You have osteopath and supplements maker, Joseph Mercola, who is one of the most successful people in this industry, who received an FDA warning letter for promoting COVID cures. And he's previously received numerous FDA warning letters over the years, including for tanning beds, slashing your risk of cancer and thermography to screen for breast cancer. And since this is being hosted in Australia, thank you. We have to bring up Pete Evans, <laughs> whose anti-vaccine rhetoric got him kicked off Instagram. He has adamantly promoted healing through a healthy lifestyle, going so far as to team up with developers looking to launch an Earthship commune. But then he recently also just purchased a $1 million retreat center outside of Byron Bay to evolve his business which offers, among other things, cold and conscious breath work and cryotherapy. Of course, he is also a noted anti-vaxxer. And finally, he isn't the only one to immune system shame in order to sell products, services, or lifestyles, or to create an emerging commune. So one we've covered extensively on the podcast is Gold Star Oasis, which is a forthcoming Ecolux resort on Lake Travis in Austin, Texas, which is spearheaded by the now well-known, notorious anti-vax filmmaker Mickey Willis and fellow conspiracist Joyous Hart. Now, at the launch party, they claimed that Del Bigtree, comedian JP and comedian JP Sears have already bought in, and On It founder On It is a supplement line that is also big into nootropics. Aubrey Marcus and Kyle Kingsbury were in the room. Now, every one of these men has monetized anti-vaccination fears in some capacity, either through supplement sales or by fundraising for their projects or documentaries. And now this emerging notion of a commune that is dedicated to medical freedom has become a next step in bringing these conspiracy theories to life in a very real way. So the question is, how did yogis, Reiki practitioners, and channelers merge with QAnon promoting xenophobic Americans? And one answer is in their mindset, which is effectively a privileged view of the world in which the only path to salvation occurs basically when everyone believes what I believe. And now regardless of politics, these cohorts are united by an enduring devotion to individualism and an unfailing willingness to monetize fear. Now in America, you can live your entire life without a working knowledge of either politics or science. So it's not really surprising that these domains intersect. And to be fair, many Americans are rightfully skeptical of our for-profit healthcare system that accounts for nearly 18% of our GDP and features a pharmaceutical lobby that spent nearly $5 billion in Washington DC over the last two decades. Uh, I have my reservations about this industry as well. And so it's not surprising that we confuse an industry that purposefully pushes opioids and antidepressants with the efficacy of vaccines. And they all seem enmeshed here sometimes. But of course, they're not. And more than one thing can be true, which pushes back against a lot of conspiratorial thinking. And it also drives to the heart of QAnon's infiltration of the wellness community. Influencers have subsisted on outlandish health claims about superfoods and supplements for generations. And tragically, we're far enough removed from high childhood mortality rates, the ravages of polio, and a world without antibiotics to be ignorant of the privileges that we all live with here. Now, wellness believers have been fed the notion of individual sovereignty through personal health for generations. 
which leading to the myth that they always know better than doctors. And as I said, while a critical eye on our healthcare system is warranted, these influencers often tow another line, which is never trust experts, or phrased another way, I'm the only expert who knows what's best for my body. And so one pathway that QAnon slipped into this community was by stoking fears of with vaccines and aligning with the anti-vaccination movement. And of course, this was really emboldened by the opportunistic propaganda of the disbarred physician, Andrew Wakefield. And he has long exploited fears and continues to around bodily sovereignty. Now, Eula Biss, the writer, writes in her book On Immunity that this image of a needle penetrating skin hits like a low budget horror film to these holistically minded people. And she writes, quote, the metaphors we find in this gesture are overwhelmingly fearful and almost always suggest violation, corruption, and pollution. And so for a community drunk on aspirational practices that purportedly produce purity and ascension, such as yoga, meditation, and holotropic breath work, for example, such a pollution violates their very essence, and no amount of data regarding the safety of adjuvants will suffice. And so while QAnon hit a target in the conspirituality world originally painted by Wakefield, it traces back further to Theos Bernard, a beatific muscular yogi, yogi who is considered the purveyor of ultimate health in the 1940s. So we have this image that the physical representation of the body is the ultimate image of what health means, which of course is false, but that persists here. And so today's influencers pick and choose between the toxic and beneficial depending on how it favors them. While they have no problem believing technology evolves, given how freely they exploit their followings on every social media channel imaginable, they do take issue with the idea that science also evolves. Of course, we know that the reason researchers were able to develop COVID vaccines in record time is that we have centuries of precedent now. And still, some romanticize the past wisdom of an ancient science. Yet, if we still believed in miasma theory, which incredibly some of these influencers are with this resurrection of the terrain theory, and COVID-19 would remain with us for decades, if not generations. So to conclude, science, we must remember, is a slow process that builds on itself. And it makes that feature makes it uniquely unsuited for the social media age. We simply seem intent on being victims of our own success. And so if Instagram is where you turn for information, chances are you're going to be misinformed. And so we live in two worlds right now a government agency that demands rigorous scientific trials, but has fallen susceptible to unfettered capitalism in an unchecked for-profit for healthcare system, and an army of aspirational life coaches unquestioningly selling supplements that don't have to be researched at all. And sorting through credible evidence is nearly impossible when everyone is invested in ensuring, ensuring that their products rise to the top. I'll pass it to Julian now. Thank you. Thank you so much, Derek. That was very fascinating um, and a yeah, very timely topic for sure. Um, we have Julian Walker with us next to speak. Uh, just a brief introduction before he goes. And I forgot to say earlier on that I'm actually keeping time, but these guys have you know kept their own time, which is which is great. Now, Julian Walker, uh, also part of the Conspirituality podcast, he grew up in Zimbabwe and South Africa and now lives in LA. He teaches yoga, trains yoga instructors, and is also a body worker. He is fascinated with the intersections of yoga, meditation, psychology, science, and culture, and has, ha and has written extensively on topics that include cults and gurus, spiritual bypass, and quantum woo in New Age circles. Now open to you, Julian. Thank you for that, Enchi and Derek. I'm going to talk about conspirituality beliefs and cognitive errors. So the pandemic brought a deluge of conspiracy theories onto our social media feeds. 
hosted mostly by yoga and wellness contacts. It started with 5G causing COVID, then Zach Bush MD's interview with anti-vaxxer Del Bigtree went viral. Now Bush claimed that viruses did not cause diseases. The pandemic, he said, called for a return to nature and quarantine was unconstitutional. Then he merged the authority of his medical credentials with a poetic sermon about near death experiences. And this is Bush. The danger right now is not a virus. It is that we have created sterility around the death moment out of fear. But we are here for a transformative experience where we find out we are spiritual beings, we are light beings. Now, this false dichotomy between quarantine measures and sovereign spiritual heroism that is unafraid of death would become a familiar conspirituality battle cry. In the disinformation piece, Plandemic, spiritual filmmaker Mickey Willis interviewed discredited researcher Judy Mikovits. Mikovits claimed to have lost her job and been arrested for standing up to the corrupt medical establishment. She claimed that the flu vaccine increased the likelihood of contracting COVID by 36% and that it also contained coronaviruses. She said that masks actually activate diseases dormant in your body and that hydroxychloroquine was an effective treatment. These statements, of course, all false. But Plandemic garnered millions of views. Willis then said in a video to his followers that he was willing to die for the film's message. Then came the posts about blood drinking pedophile rings and how Donald Trump alone could save us and a growing list of red pilled spiritual influencers as we have documented like Busy Gold, David Wilcock, Guru Jagat and Jay-Z Knight demonstrated the traction these ideas had amongst New Agers. But this brings us to the question, what makes spiritual people susceptible to conspiracy theories? Well, New Age spirituality often devalues science and reason in favor of trusting intuition and your heart. Many spiritual communities inadvertently teach something called spiritual bypassing, which is the avoidance of emotions and conflict via a non-attached transcendence that really is disconnection from reality. Spiritualists often see themselves as part of an awakened minority in a fallen world that they alone can save. Spirituality and conspiracy theories both take pride in being outside of the mainstream and rely on logical fallacies. One example is something I call freshman skepticism, which claims to be skeptical, but actually falls prey to the exact mistakes that skepticism seeks to inoculate us against. Healthy skepticism admits unknowns and changes beliefs based on new evidence. But freshman skepticism latches onto novel beliefs as true no matter what. Healthy skepticism checks rigorously for logical errors and weak evidence, where freshman skepticism rejects knowable facts, standards of evidence and journalism, and embraces instead confirmation bias and overgeneralizations about secret corruption, especially in the media, and medical science. Wellness advocates already did this when arguing for alternative medicine and paranormal phenomena and against vaccines. So the reasoning style was already there to be exploited. If we go back to 1947, behavioral psychologist B.F. Skinner famously demonstrated that even pigeons were susceptible to superstitious behavior. Individual pigeons in a controlled environment or Skinner box had food pellets dispensed mechanically at regular intervals. 75% of those birds developed ritualized behaviors as if whatever they were doing right before the food arrived was causing it to happen. They turned in circles or repeated unusual head movements in specific areas of the cage. Their impulse it seems was to gain agency by discovering patterns. Skinner compared this to the rituals of gamblers or the bodily movements made by bowlers after releasing the ball down the alley as if they could control it. Others like Darren Brown and Michael Stevens have informally repeated this type of experiment with people. And they too did little dances, chanted and moved back and forth through a doorway to try to conjure dollar bills that came out of a slot every 30 seconds anyway. 
QAnon's contagion was driven by the cryptic nature of Q's posts. Influential decoders called bakers published interpretations of clues or what were called breadcrumbs. Followers were also encouraged to do their own research. And this amplified apophenia or meaningful seeming patterns between actually unrelated things. Michael Shermer's concept of patternicity is useful here too. It states that whether accurate or not, pattern seeking is innate and has survival value. But in some of us, this activity is more pronounced. Increased anxiety seems to play a role. A 2011 study by West and Wilner found high levels of magical thinking about causality in subjects who had more anxiety. Hungry pigeons in the Skinner box experienced a restrictive environment and sought agency via self-conditioning. This created belief in false patterns of causality. For conspiritualists, quarantine measures and social media algorithms created a real-time indoctrination apparatus. In his 1964 essay on the paranoid style in American politics, Richard Hofstadter wrote, conspiracy theories help people comprehend complex events that are difficult to understand otherwise by attributing these events to a powerful and evil enemy group. Some conspiracy theories are only about power and money, but others have occult evil at their core. The blood libel during the European Middle Ages claimed that Jews sacrificed Christian children so as to use their blood to make matzah. QAnon made its incursion into the yoga and wellness space via the narrative of a collective spiritual awakening into seeing the evil hidden truth rising up against it in order to bring about a new utopia. Now, the astrological term new age, as in this is the dawning of the age of Aquarius, has evolved to also include ascension into higher planes beyond the illusion of mere 3D reality. Like Q Baker's spiritual influencers claim to be reading the signs of this coming awakening. If, as Dr. Voas told us, everything is connected, this disorienting crisis is a sign then of the coming ascension. If nothing is as it seems, the pandemic is an opportunity to transcend fear and anchor higher consciousness. If there are no accidents, who needs masks or vaccines? And Dr. Christiane Northrup, author of the bestseller, Women's Bodies, Women's Wisdom, began her Great Awakening video series on Facebook and Instagram on April 4th of 2020. The date, she explained, adds up to 444, which of course, represents the opening of a cosmic portal. The significant number really is the half a million followers she invited to meditate together to create a rebirth for the whole world via electromagnetism. Over the next year, Great Awakening videos repeated conspiracy theories about 5G, Bill Gates, and DNA hijacking mind control vaccines, then, escalated into endorsing QAnon and far-right sheriff militia organizations. She encouraged people to vote only for anti-vaccine candidates. Northrop enthusiastically endorsed a channel named Lori Ladd. And by December 27th, Lori Ladd was all but inciting spiritual warfare that would lead to ascension. She told her 130,000 followers that the Galactic Federation told her light workers were going to need to rise up and charge forward in their armor against the cabal, who had been controlling hum humanity for thousands of years. Physicality is an illusion, she said, and our roles in the game are beyond moral judgments of right and wrong, as we fight to overcome evil systems of control and child sex trafficking. This is December 27th. 10 days before the capital insurrection. So in closing, my analysis is that the yoga and wellness community was susceptible to 2020's far right conspiracy theories for the following reasons. Beliefs that devalue reason and evidence and elevate revelatory intuitive truths. Spiritual bypass distortions of reality in the name of transcendence. 
magical thinking conferring social capital on influencers. Pre-existing conspiracy theories that rationalize the lack of scientific evidence for beliefs about vaccines, alternative medicine, and paranormal claims. And a mostly privileged white apolitical demographic being naive in the face of political propaganda. Lastly, a Skinner box-like perfect storm of pandemic isolation, anxiety, and social media interaction with toxic, well-crafted misinformation campaigns. Thank you. Thank you, Julian. That was very fascinating that even pigeons are susceptible to <laughs> skepticism. That was, um, yeah, that was a good inclusion. Um, we have Matthew next. So Matthew Ramsky, uh, where is he? Yes, just to make sure that he can start his video and unmute. Um, Matthew, you can unmute and start your video anytime. So a bit of an introduction to Matthew Ramsky, um, third part of uh, the Consp Conspirituality podcast. Guys, he is a, I'm reading from his bio. He's a cult survivor and researcher. His 2019 book, and is on practice and all is coming, abuse, cult dynamics, and healing in yoga and beyond, um, which is the first systematic analysis of pervasive cultism in the modern yoga world. He researches and writes on abuse and spiritual movements. Um, so over to you, Matthew. Thank you so much for being here. Um, thank you so much, Enchi. Thank you for the introduction. It's a great honor. Um, and thank you, Derek and Julian. Uh, and I want to thank uh, Dr. Voas as well um, for dropping that paper along with Charlotte Ward in 2011. Uh, I just want to quote from the opening uh, of it, the first sentence of the abstract, in fact, uh, quote, the female dominated new age with its positive focus on self and the male dominated realm of conspiracy theory with its negative focus on global politics may seem antithetical, unquote. So yes, uh, there's an antithesis here. And as I speak on the topic of conspirituality and toxic social dynamics, I'd like to add some texture to that antithesis. Um, what we've seen in the social dynamics of conspirituality is not just that influencers strive to reconcile or integrate these sentiments uh, and their gendered politics. They actually play them against each other, often in rapid succession and in a kind of accelerating oscillation that trends towards higher and higher emotional tensions. Um, the zeitgeist I would describe is apocalyptic. Uh, there's a historical message, which is that catastrophes are unfolding, but salvation is nigh. But I'm actually more interested in the relational message, which is the world, which is which goes which flows from influencer to consumer. Uh, and the message is the world is filled with sexual, emotional, medical, financial, and technological abusers who can never be trusted and saviors like myself uh, who not only understand all of these things but who love you and who are looking out for you so in that sense we find conspirituality to be paradoxical socially uh, perhaps even schizotypal not in a diagnostic sense but kind of in a um, i don't know almost a, a spectacle sense from a cultic studies point of view this uh, paradoxical schizotypal nature is not an eccentricity. Uh, I would call it a technique. So as 2020 unfolded, I coined a term for how this tension is commodified on a structural level throughout the networks of conspirituality influencers. I came up with the term disaster spirituality. Now I've built this on the work of journalist Naomi Klein's work on disaster capitalism by which she describes corporations seizing on natural or ecological disasters to advance the privatization of assets and services. But in disaster spirituality, a real public health crisis like COVID or a fictional moral crisis like QAnon or its sanitized version, such as Save the Children, uh, becomes the basis for an evangelical call to spiritual renewal. 
Now, where Klein describes the seizure of public assets and utilities in the wake of a hurricane or war, disaster spirituality involves a seizure of attention and emotional commitment, which are then converted into monetized networks to sell spiritual and wellness products. And actually, they don't have to be converted into networks so much as funneled into pre-existing networks. And that's why so many of the influencers that we have followed have been so successful in their COVID pivot. Uh, the overall pressure of disaster spirituality is that the crisis must be an opportunity. So for instance, uh, the terror that the vaccine is gene therapy, this is false, is an opportunity to meditate on your essential immutable self. It's not going to change your DNA. You will still be who you are in your soul. Uh, the terror that mask mandates are brainwashing people into compliance, also not true, uh, is an opportunity to meditate on the sacred nature of your breath. Uh, the terror that scientific consensus is a conspiracy, also not true, is an opportunity to develop your own perfect intuition. And finally, the terror that your public health officials and even primary care physicians who you may have known all your life are part of a conspiracy of abuse is an opportunity to find your true allies in new age communities. So I see uh, uh, disaster spirituality as a structural mechanism, but there are interpersonal and psychosocial phenomena that support it and that then link it to the social control methods that are familiar to cultic research. Uh, so we have things like um, that are very evident, like transcendent ideology, as described by many theorists, including John Jalalich, Steve Hassan, Kathleen Mann. Uh, this would be the present crisis is leading to an inevitable great awakening, as we hear from Northrop, uh, which gives all social relations a sense of crucial mission. Now, in QAnon terms, everyone is deputized as a digital soldier in an online war. Uh, that's also a that's also a, a a route to gamification and participation that way. Uh, we also have charismatic leadership, also uh, featured in the work of Lalich and Hassan. Uh, and this gives all social relations a heightened emotional charge that overcomes the data and content. So followers can be far more attached to the influencer's mystic radiance than to their ideas. And this poses a real challenge for really boring public health PR uh, and uh, you know, sorry to say the, the people who often represent it, uh, because correcting disinformation is one thing, but disrupting charismatic social networks is another. In fact, as Hassan told us, I think on our podcast, uh, correcting disinformation might actually exacerbate feelings of relational betrayal that drove the follower towards the charismatic leader to begin with. Now, the cult studies theory that most resembles the schizotypal rhythm of disaster spirituality uh, comes from Alexandra Stein's application of disorganized attachment. Um, now, she says that uh, the core of any cultic activity is built around a group or a leader who is able to hardwire disorganized attachment patterns into their followers through this oscillation between terror and love. She says that disorganized attachment, which is a, a condition first observed by child psychologists who study young children who develop erratic and high stress responses to traumatizing caregivers, uh, is the model for cultic bonding in which a group member feels contradictory impulses, that the group provides a safe haven, but that the group also preaches paranoia. Now, as a cult survivor myself, I can note briefly that how this feels in real time is this sense of not being able to leave the presence of the charismatic leader because he was simultaneously, A, the source of terror about the outside world, and B, the source of protection from it. Uh, so I've brought three examples of this. The, um, the, the uh, screen share isn't going to give good audio, but we don't really need it. You just need the visuals. Uh, first, um, the day after Mickey Willis releases Plandemic and it's starting to go viral, he posts the following to Facebook. So he's got this clip. Um, and let me just find it here. My eyes are puffy and red because I just had a really fantastic quarantine cry. 
If you haven't done that yet, I highly recommend it. Very purifying, very clarifying. So much so that I'm compelled to say something to you. Okay, so that's enough. I'm not going to give him more of a platform. But what I want to show uh, and be clear about uh, is that, um, oh, stop screen share. Sorry. Uh, what I want to be clear about is that um, just the day before, he's proposed this horrifying dystopia in which noble whistleblowing scientists are silenced by big pharma. Uh, and Big Pharma wants to poison the globe with vaccines. And then this sermon, Julian referred to it in his presentation, bonds with that same audience with offers of love, acceptance, nurturance, and solidarity. And of course, brilliant HD lighting and gorgeous sound. You couldn't really hear it, but it has a real sort of ASMR quality to it. He's just right on top of that microphone. Uh, so in two days, he's activated this kind of disa this disaster spirituality flip. Uh, he's scaring the shit out of the world, and then he's offering a safe haven. But that safe haven is really dependent upon his confidence, his charisma, his beauty, uh, for lack of a better world, word. Now, on a smaller scale, I don't think I'll play other clips, because uh, I think you get the idea. But on a smaller scale, and earlier in the same COVID timeline, uh, we have Dr. Kelly Brogan with her message to dispel fear. Um, she releases this in the middle of April, uh, and she comes out and basically says, COVID isn't real. Uh, I don't believe that the virus is uh, the cause of what's going on right now. Uh, but re what's really happening is the uh, initiation of the transhumanist agenda, and she also compares the lockdown measures to Holocaust. But the whole thing is framed uh, as a kind of, I'm here with you, I'm going to make intrusive eye contact with the camera, and I am here to love you and support you, and here, you know, here's my beautiful home in Miami in the background, and you're going to be safe with me. Um, and then also we have visions like Christiane Northrup uh, playing her harp into Facebook, uh, which is after months of daily sermons given to her audience about how Tony Fauci is lying, uh, the vaccines will inject radioactive tracking devices, uh, and also, as Julian mentioned, linking to channelers who are receiving divine messages about pedophilia. So, in Alexandra Stein's model, being lulled by that harp is kind of like being drawn in by the siren song. So uh, it leads to a question, which is, are Willis, Brogan, and Northrop running cults? Um, I'm not saying that there isn't enough data, interpersonal, on the ground data to say. I have reported that Brogan's online treatment programs can be very high demand and suppressive of dissent, and that she recruits through deceptive campaigns such as community is immunity. Now, the value of Stein's analysis is that it doesn't depend on sharp distinctions between full and casual membership in a group. Uh, and it's the quality of the relationship within the group or in relationship to the influencer in our scenario of 2020, that's the top concern. I'd say that this is valuable uh, in terms of analysis in today's landscape, uh, because the cult word is thrown around freely, but also sensationalistically. And it's applied to movements like QAnon, even though that same analysis has its origins in pre-digital landscapes, and it can't really account for online recruitment patterns uh, and leaderless groups. Uh, However, we've also seen a relationship between real world brick and mortar uh, cultic organizations and conspirituality content. So we have studied Guru Jagat or Katie Griggs, who looks to be running a high demand environment at the Rama Institute in Venice Beach. Uh, and that's, of course, modeled on the historical cult of her mentor, Yogi Bhajan, the creator of Kundalini Yoga. And this particular overlap allows her to do a number of things. Uh, you know, Rama already has a paranoid communication style and network that's laid in. So COVID is kind of just a new content update. 
Uh, and the themes of conspirituality overlap closely with the cultic perception that the conventional world is abusive, aggressive, and out to destroy the cult's religion. Uh, Yogi Bhajan was famously paranoid about believing the CIA was about to kill him. Um, cult organizations thrive on disaster spirituality, both internally and in recruitment terms, uh, because the world in crisis will always prove the safety and correctness of the group. Now, I would say I would leave this uh, with some notes for further research. Um, given uh, the clear utilization of cultic modes of bonding. And when we put together the paper uh, from this conference, uh, I will be more detailed of uh, those linkages uh, that I'm referring to. But seeing what we've seen conspiritualists using in terms of uh, cultic techniques, I really wonder how we're going to strike a balance between deplatforming information and restoring relationships that have been broken by conspirituality. Uh, and the conflict is really best illustrated by the contrasting messages given by uh, Imran Ahmed and Steve Hassan on two episodes of our podcast. Ahmed's focus is on limiting and deplatforming disinformation, and that runs counter to Hassan's focus on repatriating conspiritualists through improved relationships. So the question that I'm left with here, uh, and that I'm always trying to wrestle with, uh, and we all are on the podcast, is how do you deplatform content without further isolating people, without further contributing to the factors that chase them into this realm of forbidden knowledge? So thank you. Thank you very much, Matthew. That was really insightful. Um, thanks also for sharing your experiences. Um, it looks like we have about 12 minutes for Q&A. So I might just have to pick the shorter questions. I apologize um, to anybody. Like, uh, so let's perhaps go to, um, there are some questions about like, you know, authority, post-truth, um, and I think that's quite covered in Joel's uh, a question here from Joel Hill. So he says, absolutely love the podcast, guys. Seeing you do solo bits to camera has been a treat. Now, with the mechanisms of growth in the conspirituality world being exponential, sharing and feelings of cult-like togetherness being very difficult to break, how do we counter this? How can the utterly boring message of public health and trust in institutions reshape itself to give the same buzzy feeling that conspirituality pushes to give their audience or even just compete at all for hearts and minds? I'll, I'll start by saying that I, I, I think it's very challenging and I don't think that the current governmental structures, they're, they're always behind. I, I work in tech full time, I have for a while and the, like I know people who work in government offices who are on 20 year old computers. I just think they're behind in every capacity, but I will say that I, there are a good amount of well, like doctors who have taken to social media. Uh, Danielle Bellardo is one that we interface with often who is using social media to educate in ways that speak to the culture right now that I think is really important. So unfortunately from a larger picture system point of view, I think it's going to be very challenging. But even if you look at the influencers recovering, they don't have a large system they're working within. They're often their own islands that then converge. So I think it's going to be up to more doctors, nurses, and healthcare professionals to follow in the same manner. And we're seeing, and we're seeing some, but I think we should hopefully be seeing more of them. I think that uh, Imran Ahmed was pretty clear that uh, public health communications are never going to compete with the flash of conspirituality. I think his word was nobody retweets the NHS. Uh, and so I think what we've explored in a lot of episodes over the past year is a distinction that we can make between um, uh, online activism and hygiene practices and the fact that you know, when we know somebody personally who has become uh, delusional or who has become, you know, greatly impacted by uh, conspirituality rhetoric or QAnon, that it's really the personal relationship that has to be restored uh, offline, uh, most, most importantly. Uh, and that means that we have a system that indoctrinates 
people into um, very antisocial ways of looking at public health and um, you know, discharging their anxiety about uh, global crises into the public sphere. And that happens very quickly. And then we have in-person you know, possibilities for repair that happen much more slowly. Uh, and so, you know, it's a difficult, it's a difficult question. It's a difficult question, but I think we have to be clear about the difference between, you know, are you superficially communicating on the level of data in the online format, or are you actually mending a relationship with somebody who, who is in pain? I'll just add quickly, I, I think it is a really difficult question. And I think there are multiple angles, uh, one of which you bring up often, Matthew, which is the the need for uh, some sort of sanity in terms of uh, in terms of healthcare in the United States, so yeah. that people don't feel so squeezed uh, by a situation like this that they that they do go to false authority figures. But I'm also I'm a big fan of the cultural conversation. I'm I I don't take it lightly that we started a podcast like this and and there is an audience for it and that we're here today and that. People want to have these conversations, familiarize themselves with the issues, uh, be sort of inoculated against, against this toxicity out in the world, and maybe be able to have these conversations with others or be able to use their platforms to do some educating. I, I think these are, these are worthwhile endeavors. Uh, one point about uh, public health communications and whether or not it would ever be as attractive, uh, if that, if that uh, PR is or the, those comms are coming from, you know, an American state uh, health department where, uh, you know, people lack health coverage, there's the fundamental disconnect. Um, you know, I, I often speculate that uh, the, the, the QAnon conspirituality scene would be far less impactful in the US uh, than it is if there were universal health coverage and perhaps UBI. Thank you very much. Um, so we actually have David Voss, who wrote the paper on conspirituality with Charlotte Watt, um, here with us in the audience. So he has a question, and, and he offers his thanks and congratulations to all of you guys for doing such a you know, great work in um, creating public understanding of conspirituality. So his question is, as more and more people are vaccinated, and it becomes increasingly clear that they are protected rather than harmed. Will the wind be taken out of the sails of anti-vax propaganda? Or will anecdotes about side effects be weaponized effectively? Uh, I'll just say yes. And thank you, David. Nice to, we haven't talked yet, but we will have you on the podcast. Um, yes, I have. I just made my appointment for Monday. I'm very excited. But what we've seen in the US is there's over 100 million doses uh, there have been no deaths. The side effect, like even even the way that these influencers are posting of the side effects, they're actually posting that the vaccinations are working. You get sick for a day, <laughs> like that. That means that they're working. So, I, I will say that. And vac anti-vax rhetoric began with the inception of vaccinations. So, anytime new ones are introduced or there's a new virus, you're going to get an uptick in anti-vaccination propaganda and it's going to die down. And fortunately we're seeing evidence of that um, because it's just common sense. So I think, I do have faith in some people that they'll reach common sense. Sorry, my cat's very needy right now. <laughs> it seems like uh, that the, that the vaccine moment is really the, it's like the point of the spear, so to speak, with regard to this existential threshold for the conspirituality movement. It's like when it goes, when it penetrates the, the subject, the citizen, uh, are they going to be immune to the ideology of conspirituality? I think that's the real sort of, that's what's at stake for, you know, the dirty dozen disinformation anti-vaxxers that, that Ahmed has, has just published on. Uh, and, but it's like, as a crisis point, I think it's similar to um, the QAnon's uh, devotees sitting in various watch parties on Telegram during the inauguration, watching the time countdown 
uh, you know, it's 11.30, it's 11.40, nothing's happening. Is he CGI? Is that really Biden? I think I saw a glitch in the matrix. Wait a minute, he's putting his hand on the Bible. Is that really happening? Uh, and then finally it happens. And, and I didn't watch this happen, but the researchers that I spoke to um, who were watching multiple Telegram channels at once saw this kind of like shattering of uh, a, a mirror uh, where people would turn on each other, uh, they would ask each other to keep the faith, they would say, no, we've all been had. Uh, there was a lot of sort of social chaos that exposed the fact that these people had not actually formed secure attachments with each other. They weren't actually uh, where we go one, we go all. They weren't going to be there for each other uh, in any kind of social support sense. And But you know, three, four weeks later, we see that they have, because they have nowhere to go, they find other telegram channels where, you know, new aspects of those, you know, that sharded mirror can be looked at and fetishized and they can run their fingers over. Uh, and uh, they will find other things to occupy themselves with. Uh, I just don't think that, that, um, that QAnon will be central. Now, with regard to conspirituality, the vaccine itself can no longer at a certain point be the point, be the sort of like critical apocalyptic moment in which all of Sergei's theories are proven or disproven. Uh, they're going to have to work up to something else. That's why it's a Waterloo moment um, that, uh, that they have opportunistically built towards. And, you know, if they have successfully um, uh, diversified, you know, in terms of what they offer, if they haven't, you know, poured everything into anti-vax sentiment, if they also have a lot of kundalini yoga going on the side, or if they're offering turmeric with their breath work, then, then they have other options, right? So, um, I, I guess I didn't answer, uh, Professor, but I, I think it's an important moment. Uh, and I think we'll see a muting of activity before it spreads out and, and figures out what, how else it, it's going to monetize. Yeah, I'm, I'm hopeful that, uh, that it won't stop us from getting to herd immunity. I am less optimistic about uh, it going away. I mean, the, the vaccine causes autism. Uh, uh, misinformation is still out there and still popular and still affects a lot of people who, who don't know better. Um, and I think that this incursion of, of uh, wild viral conspiracy politics is probably going to be with us for a while. Thank you so much, uh, all three of you. I th actually think this is all the time that we have. I do apologize to anybody who has asked questions that we couldn't get to. Um, but what you have responded to goes very nicely into our next um, session on vaccine hesitation hesitancy and COVID-19. And um, we have presenters Paul Bramadette, Naomi Smith, and Tom Eichner. I hope I'm pronouncing his name correctly. Um, so hang around. Uh, we'll have a short five minutes break, and we look forward to seeing you next. Thank you so much, Enchi. Thank, Thank you. Thank you.